Welcome everyone, welcome to this event. Um, my name is Pete Smith from the University of Aberdeen and I'll be chairing the session today. It's part of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Curious Programme, which runs from the 7th to the 30th of August online, with events offering insight from some of the world's leading experts across key th three key themes of health and well-being, innovation and in invention, and our planet. Uh, please take a look at the Curious website um, to take part in unique group discussions, online workshops, and to tune into panel discussions like this one on a range of topics. The format for today will be our three speakers will each present a 10 minute talk and then we'll have discussion and Q&A afterwards. You can submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen throughout and you can also like and upvote and downvote other people's questions to make them more popular and visible so that we'll deal with those questions that are most popular first. Um, the event will be recorded and it will be live streamed on the Royal Society of Edinburgh YouTube channel. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce Peter Nino. Peter is a glaciologist based at the University of Edinburgh. And his research over the past three decades has focused on glaciers and ice sheets and investigating the factors controlling the rate at which they're disappearing in our warming world. Pete, over to you. Great, thank you, Pete. So I'm just going to share my screen. OK, so um, as Pete said, my name is Pete Nino. I'm a professor of glaciology at the University of Edinburgh. And what I want to do um, in this first talk is just give a bit of a background to the changing climate and in particular um, how it's impacting glaciers and ice sheets, which is what I um, work on. So my background is very much in field based um, glaciology. Uh, and when I first started about 30 years ago, the sorts of headlines that you see here on the front cover in this instance of time simply weren't, um, weren't occurring. You know, there was no suggestion that um, climate was changing um, at a dramatic rate and forced by, by humans. So things have changed considerably to the extent that it's sort of won't be a surprise to most people that um, you know, the cryosphere or ice masses have become scientifically, societally and politically increasingly relevant. So just a couple of news items from recent years reported in the BBC. Last year, um, a big paper came out indicating that Greenland ice sheets melt was accelerating um, dramatically. And then a previous uh, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report uh, indicating that really it was the final call to save the world from climate catastrophe, that we really need to act now um, before it's too late. And of course, the sort of the real key driver for the most dramatic changes that we're seeing in our climate are greenhouse gases and CO2 in particular. So just sort of during my lifetime, we can see how much um, the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has increased. And we're now up at about 414 parts per million at the moment. And the driver for that has of course been uh, carbon emissions from primarily from combustion. There are other sources that we can see you know, on a longer time scale of the last 2000 years, a really dramatic increase from about the onset of the industrial revolution with this exponential rise in CO2 emissions and now bring it up to date, we're even off the scale um, here. And the net impact of that has of course been that our planet is warming. There's lots of different lines of evidence. Perhaps the, the, the strongest um, collective evidence is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which comes out about every seven or eight years. And their most recent report indicating you know, how global temperatures have changed over the planet uh, during the last sort of just over 100 years and on the order of sort of over a, a degree C temperature change. And if we look at that in a different way, this is the time on the, on the um, X axis here. And we can see there's really been an acceleration in warming, uh, in rate of warming in the last sort of 50 or so years to the extent that 2019 was the 43rd consecutive year that global land and ocean temperatures um, were at least nominally above 20th century average. So we've got a very clear warming signal and clear drivers for that signal. And of course, if you're a big lump of ice, in this instance, the, the Greenland ice sheet where I've done a lot of work and you've already got melt occurring anyway, if you increase those temperatures, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start generating um, more melt water, more meltwater on the ice sheet surface, of course, drains off the edges or 
drains into big cavernous moulins such as these, which drain the water to the bed, and that uh, very rapidly reaches the ocean. And obviously, if we melt glasses, the ocean will, will rise. Now, now clearly, we're not, we're not suggesting that all the ice sheets and glasses are going to melt um, extremely rapidly. If they did so, sea level would rise by about 65 metres. Um, but the, the ice is melting and sea level rise um, supports that, or demonstrates evidence of that, with about 25 centimetres of sea level rise over the, over the sort of last, last century. And then, of course, what we're most concerned about are different projections here of future sea level rise according to different um, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So as a result of all of these um, issues, it's pretty clear that um, you know, politicians um, and society you know, need and want to know how fast glaciers and ice sheets are melting. So what I'm going to do is just give a, a little bit of an update on, for example, Greenland, where I've done a lot of, a lot of research over the last uh, few years or so. And it's clear here that the ice sheet is losing mass. So this is one of the earlier satellite uh, missions which shows that in the sort of reds and yellows around the edge of the ice sheet, um, thinning was being observed and particularly pronounced in a few sort of concentrated places. And over the subsequent sort of 10 or so years, we've got clear confirmation that Greenland is losing mass um, due to this, you know, due to rapid thinning around the margin. And this is from different and uh, numerous different methods. And well, what's driving the change? Well, one aspect is obviously pretty clear, I would suggest, which is that we've got global warming, but in particular, it's amplified in the Arctic for a number of different reasons. So that what we can see here, this is the increase in annual average temperature over the planet over about the last 60 years. Um, but we can see that it's particularly pronounced in the, in the north, um, in, the, in the high Arctic, where warming has been of sort of two or three degrees magnitude. And you know, just one example of that is that you know, earlier this, uh, just a couple of months ago, the Arctic Circle saw its highest ever recorded temperature of 38 degrees in, in Siberia. So obviously, if temperatures are going up, we're going to see increased melt rates and increased melt extents, and lots of different data sets show that. Just sort of one uh, thing, you know, last year, Greenland ice sheet beats all-time one-day melt record, just another indicator of the, the warming signal that we're seeing. But the other thing that's also increasing the mass loss from Greenland are the fact that we've got these marine terminating glaciers, these big glaciers or arteries that drain ice from the center of the ice sheet. And this is the terminus here, this is the ocean. And these glaciers have been uh, retreating, but not only have they been retreating, they've also been accelerating. So clearly you've got a, the front of a tidewater glacier here and the fjord here. And if that glacier flows more quickly and carves more icebergs, then you're losing more ice from up on the ice sheet. And the majority of the, the glaciers around Greenland that are flowing into the ocean are both retreating and accelerating. So this is one of the largest on the west coast, Jakobshavn and Isbray. And we can see a sort of longer term retreat signal. But what we can also see is over the last, um, so over about a 15 year period, the, the ice front retreated over 15 kilometers, but it also accelerated. In 1995, the front of the glacier was going about six kilometers a year by two, uh, 10 years later, it was going 12 kilometers a year. And another um, eight years after that, it was had moved, accelerated up to 18 kilometers a year. So these glaciers are retreating and flowing faster. So they're throwing more ice into, or chucking more ice out into the ocean and therefore contributing to sea level rise. And if we look at the net effects of these changes in, for example, Greenland, we can see over the sort of last few decades, an exponential increase in the, in the cumulative mass loss and an exponential increase in in the contribution to sea level rise, of which about 50% of the loss is due to the ice dynamics, and about 50% of the loss is due to surface, surface melt. And if we look more widely at other ice masses around the, around the globe, Antarctica is similarly losing mass at an increasing rate, primarily due to losses of marine terminating glaciers in West Antarctica, as shown in the red here, but also pretty much all of the um, mountain glaciers in the Alps here, but also in the Canadian Rockies and the Andes are losing mass and retreating. So that if we look at the sort of previous IPCC summary report, we can see increasing trends in mass loss. Obviously the, the, the rates are increasing and actually Greenland is, uh, is predicted very shortly to become the biggest contributor to global, um, global sea level rise and, and ice 
mass loss. So it's pretty clear, you know, globally, ice mass loss is accelerating and thus so is the rate of sea level rise. So we, we're in the middle of the COVID crisis. Does that offer us anything, any hope that we might be reducing um, emissions and concentrations of greenhouse gases? And there are certainly, um, you know, some of the, 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 the gases and emissions in the atmosphere have decreased. So for example, nitrogen dioxide, which is a pollutant, you can see really clear reduction in nitrogen dioxide density um, over China between January and then February as a result of the sort of shutting down of large parts of the um, economy for that period. But this isn't really impacting, uh, this is more air quality in, in terms of respiratory issues. If we look at the, the last sort of five years of CO2 emissions, we can see that the black line is um, a, a running mean detrended for the, for the annual cycle. And we can see that really there's, there's no evidence as, uh, that we can see any sort of clear dip in CO2 emissions as a result of COVID. So just to finish then, it was really, um, I get a bit tired now that most of my presentations either to undergrads or in public arenas like this are, are sort of rather negative because of the impacts on ice sheets. But it's really just to say, so one of my best friends from university, Nigel Topping is now leading the UK high level climate action champion for COP26. And I asked him what would his key take homes be if you were getting individuals to try and act and just quickly, oops, sorry, but just to say, you know, change your car if you can, get a, an electronic vehicle, make sure that you're on a 100% renewable energy tariff, you know, get healthy and change to a flexitarian diet, use government uh, funds that are available to improve your home's thermal efficiency, and do get involved in cons conservation activities such as supporting tree planting and, and woodland expansion. Because I think Robert Swan sums it up, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And governments and big industry have a responsibility, but I think we all do as well as individuals. And I will finish there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. That's a very enlightening talk. We've got a couple of questions already, but we'll take them in the Q&A session at the end. Okay, I'll stop so my now video. I'd like to, now I'd like to introduce our second speaker. It's Camilla Tumin, who's an economist. She's focused on the climate risk in rural systems in West Africa. She's the former director of IED, and uh, Camilla's a professor at Lancaster University Environment Center. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and she also works for the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Camilla, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, so now we're going to move from the Arctic to the tropics. So in, in this talk, I'm going to outline what I've learned from my research in West Africa and how it illuminates the choices we need to make globally and here in our own societies, um, particularly to address climate change and to build back be better from the COVID pandemic. I started off my professional life working in West Africa, first teaching economics in Nigeria, before studying in a in a small village called Delongibugu in Mali. Mungo Park visited this village in 1796 on his way to find the great river Niger. During my two years in Mali, I wanted to understand how people managed to prosper in situations of great risk and uncertainty. They face uncertainty about rainfall and how much of their crop they will harvest. They face great risks about health and demography. Will they have any living children and manage successfully to bring them up? And they're also subject to great risks to do with politics and security. I've been going back every few years to revisit this over the last 40 years to get a sense of how life has been changing and how people cope with the challenges they face. And I have a new book which came out this January, published by Oxford University Press, called Land, Investment and Migration, 35 Years of Village Life in Mali, that tries to answer some of those questions. 
So how do people cope with risk and uncertainty? Well, in our society, we try and save, we take out insurance and we build up pension funds. During the pandemic, government borrows money to pay out large amounts to put people on furlough. In countries like Mali, in West Africa, the government provides next to nothing. So rural people need to hedge their bets, diversify their crops, add livestock to their household activities and get involved in lots of other forms of income earning. They also work collectively, sharing risks with other people in large family groups and they invest in social relationships. They also try to work out the best long-term strategies to enable their children to thrive, such as sending them to school. So what have been the main headline changes over 35 or 40 years? Well, first, rainfall has increased quite a lot since I lived there in the 1980s, as you can see from this diagram. But that rain has been falling in more intense storms, often causing flooding. They got more than 160 millimetres in 24 hours last year. That's more than six inches. Millet can't swim, and so it suffers. Crop harvests have also been falling in terms of yields per hectare and yields per person which means that farming is much less viable. Families have no grain to store to get them through hard times now. So many young men feel they'd rather try and make a living in town. So they've left the village and gone to earn their fortunes elsewhere. In terms of demography, there's been a big fall in infant mortality rates. Population growth has increased to more than three and a half percent per year and people continue to live in very large households, which helps them spread risks. But everybody says they're also worried about rising individualism and consumerism. There's a competitive rivalry that means people are less and less interested in working with each other for the joint household estate. Land has also become scarcer partly because a big sugarcane plantation has been set up close by, which has evicted hundreds of families who used to farm that land. And they've all headed north and west into the area surrounding villages like Delongibugu. This big increase in land area cultivated has brought a shortage of pasture land for grazing and a consequent fall in soil fertility. On the plus side, People are very keen to embrace new technology, buying up mobile phones, solar panels, plows and carts for farming. They're really quick adopters when they see something that suits them. Finally, the civil conflict which started in 2012 has worsened throughout the country with villagers caught between their utter contempt for the corrupt self-centered government and its failings and their dislike of jihadis. Yesterday, there was a coup in the capital Bamako. The president has been removed and a military council established this morning. It's very uncertain what will happen next. So how does experience from a small village in West Africa throw light on what's been happening here in the UK and Scotland in particular? First, it's brought home to me that people are people wherever they are across the world, trying to do the best for themselves and their families in often difficult circumstances. So before you try and tell them what they should do, you need to understand and respect where they are today, how they see things, where they've come from and their plans for the future. Second, the COVID crisis has happened on top of everything else. It didn't somehow wipe the slate.
We seem to have lost Camilla for a moment. We'll just try and get her back. Bear with us, please. Can you hear me? Yes, Camilla, you're back. Please, please Thanks. try again. If you can launch in your presentation again, that'd be great. Sorry. Good to go, Camilla. Great. Thanks. So um, I'm a part-time prof at Lancaster University, so I spend a lot of time in northwest England, where rainfall has greatly increased in volume and intensity, bringing big floods to places like Appleby and Carlisle. In December 20, 2015, some parts of the country received more than 300% of expected rainfall. That's in the dark, dark blue parts of the map. And it started a very helpful conversation between urban dwellers who are fed up with being flooded every few years and upland farmers about the interconnectedness of landscape and territory. For example, should the hills be grazed by sheep, which increases erosion and runoff, or left to rewild with the introduction of bears, wolves and beavers? Whose interests should count? So in terms of building back better and finding solutions to some of our shared problems, I think there are three avenues we must follow. We must decarbonise our economies and go for zero carbon, both here in Scotland and worldwide. Energy is a central part of that, with solar, solar panels a brilliant solution, if not always in Scotland, but in many places most of the time, particularly if you can supplement them by battery storage systems. Second, as Peter mentioned, Scotland has the privilege of, hoping, of hosting COP26 in November of next year. Globally, we need to agree an ambitious and rising carbon price. Here at home, we need to use the opportunity to put our own house in order. To decarbonisation will bring losses for some parts of Scotland and the UK for those people whose lives and communities have relied on carbon intensive activities like coal and oil. Hence the importance of a just transition process to address head on the economic costs and political consequences of going for zero carbon. We must also find ways to reshape our landscapes, embed greater carbon so that they become more resilient to climate extremes and flooding better able to produce local food, biodiversity benefits, healthy soils and healthy people. And finally, most vitally, we must continue to argue for collective solutions to address our problems over the long term. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, the thing that defines us as human beings is relationship. And it's within relationships and communities that we become the people we're meant to be. I think COVID's made clear to all of us how much we rely on others and equally the pleasure of giving help to others. It's also made clear the need for a strong public authority, which has the credibility to constrain individual actions for the common good and invest public funds in protecting the vulnerable. Thank you. Thanks very much, Camilla. That was an excellent talk. Thank you. We've got a few more questions on the Q&A box, but we'll save those for later, as we did for Peter. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Elise Carmel, who's a chemist and Scottish Waters chief scientist. 
to join Scottish Water following a career in academia at Anfield University, where she held a chair in water technology. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Society of Chemistry. She remains an active applied scientist focused on the opportunities to produce renewable energy, recover resources, and manage uh, emerging contaminants. Elise, over to you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, and uh, great to be speaking to you all this afternoon. So following on from the, the Arctic, the tropics, um, I now want to talk about the impact of, of climate change in Scotland uh, for uh, our water sector uh, and also some of the areas that we're working on uh, for mitigation. So the biggest challenge facing Scottish water is uh, climate change. Uh, we've heard already in relation to the climate predictions, and I'm sure as an audience, you're, you're more than familiar with this as well. Um, and we're looking in general at warmer, when, warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers potentially. And that being combined with um, a significant change in, in rainfall intensity. So looking by 2050 for 30% increases from um, uh, 2007 levels uh, from in relation to weight, uh, rainfall intensity um, in the West, rising obviously as time moves on, uh, both uh, throughout Scotland in terms of uh, increasing rainfall intensity. Now, Climate change, then the impacts of that on Scottish water are, are quite um, wide and, uh, and varied. So um, the immediate ones when you're looking at this increased rainfall intensity is very much the impact around um, that amount of volume uh, entering our sewers. So we have already um, in the country a lot of combined sewers so that's the more traditional um, method of combining uh, source water uh, runoff uh, from roads uh, etc from your household roof uh, alongside the foul drainage uh, from your house or, or from industry and that increased percentage of uh, rainfall intensity um, really means that uh, we have a lot more water entering our sewers, possibly 100% more on occasions. And that, um, as you can imagine, obviously increases uh, sewer flooding and what we really don't want to happen uh, there. And also um, the discharge from um, what's, uh, what's called our combined sewer overflows. So parts of our network where um, that, uh, needs, that will spill uh, if the, the rainfall uh, gets too high. Um, so we have a number of impacts there on, um, you know, on uh, sewer flooding, uh, and also in terms of then the impacts on our, our treatment works with this volume of, of, of rain of water coming through. Um, but it's not just the uh, the, the the sewer and the the wastewater treatment that's affected, also our, our source water quality uh, is affected as well. Um, most of our, um, the water that um, we all drink in Scotland predominantly uh, comes from um, uh, upland um, uh, surface sources, very little groundwater. And most of those catchments are very high in um, peat um, and natural what we would call natural organic matter. And that's what gives um, the, the water that you see in um, uh, lochs, rivers, etc., uh, that you know, sort of uh, chocolate coloration. Um, but with climate change and with increased rainfall intensity, we are finding that a lot more of that color, that natural organic matter, also a lot more potentially of the pesticides, etc., are being washed out of the catchments, especially if the catchments uh, have been maybe eroded, some of the peatland uh, catchments, and that uh, potentially impacts the quality of water we're supplying uh, for our customers and also is causing potentially more carbon to be used in the, the treatment uh, of, of that water. 
So we do have a number of issues around the source water quality, um, also the water supply. Um, you may think it rains a lot in Scotland, and I've just said it, it, there's increased rainfall intensity, but we do actually have areas of Scotland where we are um, experiencing uh, drought conditions on occasions and that's increasing um, and also in particular um, issues surrounding water supply to, to some of our, uh, our islands. Um, so again uh, with the predictions of uh, warmer drier conditions in the summer the predictions around uh, water supply um, are, are also um, uh, impacting there. So there are a number of um, areas which are impacted by climate change uh, for us uh, in, in, in Scotland. So we must do something about this. We really rely heavily on um, the ability to deliver our services on the natural environment and we must therefore adapt um, our approaches to how we manage climate change and secure the, the future reliability and sustainability of the country's water uh, and wastewater services. So we must adapt um, our services to deal with climate change. Yes, of course, we need to do that. But we also must eliminate greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to the climate emergency. And we have a commitment to become uh, net zero by 2040. We are an emissions intensive business and that does result in our carbon emission footprint being quite large. What you have on the screen uh, here is our operational uh, carbon. And as you can see, a lot of that is associated with the electricity we're using to treat water, to pump water, uh, and the same with the, the wastewater uh, treatment and, and, and pumping uh, as well. Um, but as the grid um, becomes um, greener, uh, we're using more renewable electricity, we're also producing more electricity, the emissions which are associated with our processes, which is the 17%, you can see here, they will become increasingly uh, important as well. And those emissions are things like nitrous oxide, uh, which are byproducts of some of the biological treatment we use uh, to treat wastewater, uh, for example. But it's not just our operational carbon. It's really important that we also look at the carbon associated with our investment decisions, uh, i.e. The, pro the, the, um, uh, the treatment options, the networks, uh, the concrete uh, and the steel, et cetera, uh, that, that, we're, that we're building. If we just looked at operational emissions um, in sort of carbon accounting practices, it would potentially be relatively straightforward for us as a business to achieve net zero emissions over say the, a 20 year period. Um, as then we would look at um, operational emissions which are in our, our direct control um, and we'd overlook um, carbon emissions which are associated with you know, our, our capital investment program, or indeed emissions which are associated with our supply chain. So with this in mind, we would be able to potentially achieve um, net zero uh, by working to provide our, um, our own electricity, increase renewable energy generation, uh, etc. But to be honest, that would completely miss the point. Um, and climate change is a real threat. We've, we've heard from the other uh, speakers, you yourselves know, uh, and I'm sure appreciate this. Um, and we've got to therefore pursue uh, net zero emissions, not just from our operational carbon, uh, but also we've got to try and do everything we possibly can to minimise emissions associated with our all of our ac activities and also maximizing the contribution uh, we can make regardless of who's 
carbon uh, it's associated with, whether it's ours or our, our supply chain. So that's why we want to look beyond our operational emissions, which are under our control, but also include in our net zero target of by 2040 emissions which are associated uh, with our investment um, area. So another area of emissions that's in, important to, to raise is also the carbon emissions which are associated with water use uh, in the home. So about 6% of UK carbon emissions uh, are associated with the water industry, um, which is roughly equivalent to the aviation industry, though I appreciate not currently. Um, and about 1% of those emissions are from the treatment and transport uh, of water and, and wastewater to our customers that I've outlined. But about 5% of the emissions are actually associated with the use of water in our home, and in particular, the, the use uh, um, of heating up of water uh, in the home. So saving water saves energy and, and therefore carbon, um, both to heat the water and also there to treat the water. Uh, so again, saving water is really an important aspect to, to also uh, look at. So in terms of what we've been doing, um, we have been making considerable efforts. I appreciate I know it's not enough uh, and I know we've just got to keep going. Uh, you know, time is marching on and I've seen some of the, the sort of comments in the Q&A, totally agree. Um, we have since uh, 2007 uh, had a 45% reduction in our operational emissions by reducing leaks and through the use of solar, hydro, wind power, uh, etc. Um, and also COVID uh, incident has also provided a real turning point for us. Uh, and as the other speakers have mentioned, you know, how can we build back better uh, from, uh, from the COVID situation? Um, like other areas and, and uh, like um, I'm sure the organizations everyone works for here, um, we've actually shown we can uh, effectively operate uh, without uh, charging around the country and charging down to London uh, all the time. Um, but for us, it doesn't, uh, that reduction in travel um, for, has also shown that for us as a sector, it's not just the home working and the reduction in business travel, but also we've managed to accelerate the remote operation of our treatment works and we've also managed to accelerate um, uh, use of body cams and all that other types of technologies to avoid site visits and all that uh, that type of thing. Um, we've, we've also managed to just get better working practices and better partnerships with our regulators it's amazing when you're in this type of environment when you realize just what's important and what things you're doing which can create carbon emissions which actually we don't need to do uh, so we have managed to really uh, prioritize and improve uh, based on our learnings from covid so far to again reduce our emissions but going forward as well we um, to achieve our ambitions, we're accelerating, becoming more energy efficient, uh, using lower carbon energy products, uh, embracing low carbon construction, and I know I appreciate more controversially, uh, we are looking to um, store the um, emissions which we cannot uh, reduce. So that's our, our process emissions, which are complex to, uh, to, to prevent. Um, so just uh, before I finish, a, a couple of uh, examples. Um, this one um, is something I'm always particularly interested in. So in relation to using lower carbon energy products, uh, wastewater treatment provides us a huge opportunity to produce uh, renewable energy uh, within the carbon that comes through to our treatment works. There's a lot of uh, material that we can digest biologically uh, to produce biogas and therefore electricity. 
Um, and obviously, as you can appreciate, there's a lot of water, um, both through our wastewater treatment works and, uh, and also the, the water, um, where we can use electrolysis uh, to, to split and create uh, hydrogen. Uh, so again, the water sector could provide um, a step uh, towards a hydrogen economy as well. We can also produce lots of renewable uh, material, um, for example, recovering of the grit uh, that comes into our treatment works, uh, recovery of the, the nutrients uh, like, like ammonia, uh, for example. So there's quite a lot of opportunities here, and this is something we are actively working on and also recovering some of these products already. But it's not just about the, the biological treatment process. There's also a lot of opportunities around reducing the carbon in our investment and our treatment um, uh, processes. Uh, so again, we're moving to offsite fabrication, um, modular assembly. I'm sure some of these, lots of these things are familiar to yourselves. Um, but it's really important that we accelerate the take up of this and really push through and forward with uh, reducing uh, the, the choice, uh, reducing the carbon we're making, uh, the, sorry, the carbon we're uh, using uh, when we're constructing uh, material. So to conclude, climate change uh, for us is our, you know, our major uh, challenge uh, for us, it is our, uh, it is, difficult for um, uh, you know, to, to work through, but we, we must uh, continue and accelerate with what we're doing. I appreciate there's still a long way to go to decarbonise the world economy, but we've got to speed this up. And we can, as individuals and also as a water sector, make sure we are contributing to ensure that we are on the right path uh, to limit uh, the temperature rises. Um, and I hope I've shown you a little bit about how uh, we can be doing that together uh, with them um, uh, as the water sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elise. That's good to hear what Scottish Water are doing um, to try to get us towards net zero. Thanks very much. Um, so we now move to, if all the panellists can unmute and share your screens now, we'll move on to the Q&A session. Um, so I'd like to kick off, I'll start looking at the, uh, start looking at the ones that have been upvoted. So let's take the, the first one from uh, Roisin Calvert-Elliott. I understand the new climate and ecological emergency bill has been written by respected climate, energy and ecology academics, aiming to bring urgent action on the climate and ecological crisis in the law. It needs a majority of MPs to vote in favour of it before being passed to make it happen. Do the panellists have a view on this? Do they think it will enable the urgent action that's needed? If so, can we, the public, do anything to influence our, uh, our MPs? to make this happen. Who'd like to take that one first? Camilla. Well, good, interesting question. I think um, the most important thing is to tell your MP that you think this is a really important issue and you want him or her to vote in favour of its passage. I, I was surprised the other day talking to somebody in politics who said, well, actually, you know, we don't actually get much pressure from our constituents on environmental issues. And so I think it really, we must, if we're interested <laughs> to make change, join a campaign, write letters, get your MP to know that this is something that you and many of your, your fellow constituents really care about. So mobilize. Peter, anything to add? No, the only thing, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I actually, um, I only yesterday got a letter back from my local MP about um, issues to do with overfishing um, in marine protected areas. And I was actually, well, I was encouraged by the response, 
but it did also make me think that actually, you know, I've generally not written to my MP about anything. And, and clearly, if we do want to sort of try and make uh, an impact as individuals, we all do need to act. So whether it's in terms of our own individual behavior, but in relation to this, um, you know, really putting pressure on MPs, then, then I think we should. And, when we, and we note that, you know, for example, issues to do with Brexit, MPs were talking about what their local constituents wanted, um, sometimes irrespective of their own views. So I do think you know, we have a responsibility to try and, uh, and communicate with our own individual MPs. And if there's a weight of, um, a weight of body um, doing so, then at least there's a, a chance of, uh, of, uh, of impacting their, their views and opinions. And ultimately they do want our votes. That's, you know, that's why they're in politics. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Elise, anything to add? Um, yes, I, I, uh, obviously, I think very much I'd go, go with that um, approach. I'd also say um, to make sure your, your views are always uh, heard around the importance of the environment and the need for action on climate change. Um, last year and 2018, we did a, a, a significant uh, customer uh, engagement work as we were developing our, our new plans and we talked to tens of thousands of people and to be honest a lot of the feedback we got was not um, associated with um, use of Scottish water to mitigate and have a, a strong leadership position in the environment. Um, a lot of the feedback we got was that um, this wasn't important for people um, which we were surprised about. Um, so I think it's really making sure that we, as an individual, as a customer, as a constituent, uh, we say, look, look, this is the most important thing for me. We've got to do something about it. Um, as then um, there's more of a mandate. So for us in Scottish Water, if we'd got more push, uh, we would have had more of a, a mandate to, to really drive this forward. We're driving it forward anyway, um, but we, you know, um, because it's it's the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, to get that push from people really does help accelerate things. OK, thanks very much. Let's take another question. Um, this one's from, and um, please excuse my pronunciation if it's wrong of your surname, Rosanna Rabase. And it says, I think you're probably preaching to the converted here. This is not news to us, I'm afraid, although the scientific facts are endlessly shocking every time they are presented. What can we do to make global leaders take action? Question mark. What will make the fossil fuel companies leave it in the ground? So how do we move from presenting the science towards making real action and leaving the fossil fuels in the ground? Would anybody, anybody like to take that? Well, so that's where I, I mean, I'm just simply not an expert in terms of um, communicating in terms of policy, but that's where you know, I really think that um, as academics or as an academic, I've got a responsibility to at least get the, the information across more effectively. And I also think that uh, as an individual, we really do all have um, individual responsibility. Like I think, I mean, there is no single silver bullet to solve this problem. And you know, I noticed that one of the things comment about the, you know, the, the trees don't have to be planted. My kind of sense is that what we've actually got to do is we've got to tackle all of these different um, different problems in a, in a multitude of different ways. But in terms of sort of dealing with, um, dealing with the sort of the politicians, that's where my hope is that individuals such as my friend Nigel Topping, who is involved in COP26, it's, it's key climate change champions who are ultimately the ones who've got the ear of the government. Um, and I think it's the responsibility of, of leaders of in that position who have got the biggest potential, um, biggest potential influence. But I'm afraid, I, I certainly know as an academic, I found it very hard to try and get the ear of policymakers in, in government, but perhaps uh, some of the other panelists, including um, Pete, might have a different view on that. Thanks, Peter. Camilla. 
Um, yes. I mean, I think sort of 10, 15 years ago, we, certainly those of us working in the whole climate field, uh, had huge hopes for what the UN multilateral process could produce. And I think we were all uh, deeply disappointed, particularly by the Copenhagen summit back in 2009, when it was clear that that kind of top-down target-driven way of trying to bring down carbon emissions wasn't going to have the, the sort of the, the speed and the, um, the grip that we might have hoped for. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot more now. Um, people now realize that we, we need to do lots of things at the same time, top-down, um, government-led work, but also work at city level, trying to encourage those businesses that are wanting to take the lead. Um, and also trying to flag clearly that a lot of low carbon options are frankly a brilliant investment. So that things like solar and wind power are actually generating electricity um, at a price significantly below many of the fossil fuel options. So that what we need to be doing is to try and sort of accelerate the disappearance of, of those fossil fuel pr producers. And that's essentially, it's a political thing rather than a technological thing. Um, and so I think, yeah, finding, finding allies and interest groups within the political classes who, who clearly understand that and can, can help speed that process of disappearance is what needs to happen. But there'll be a hard struggle where nowhere near um, winning all of those arguments because it's not about technology, it's about interests. Elise, anything to add? Um, yeah, just add in terms of um, what will make fossil fuel companies, you know, uh, leave it in the ground, don't use it um, as an individual or as a company. Um, and that they will then in turn um, make global leaders take action. So uh, in our our company, I know it's not going fast enough, but our pro cars are now electric. Um, we generate more renewable electricity. We're moving to also in terms of grid electricity, uh, renewable green tariff only next year. Uh, so we, we just need to make sure we're absolutely minimizing um, the, 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 you know, the fossil fuel um, uh, you know, products as, as much as possible, and that we can do now. Uh, so the, the more we can do that, as I said, as individuals and as organisations, uh, the more the global leaders will, will take note and obviously, um, you know, uh, will we'll start to, uh, to move hopefully faster than they are doing uh, in relation to, to leadership and policies in these areas. Very much. We've, we've only got time for a, another one more question before we need to close. So I'm going to take two that are um, uh, related. So one is about what can bodies like the Royal Society of Edinburgh and other bodies do that to raise awareness, especially on uh, individual behaviours, particularly via STEM engagement. So science, technology um, and mathematics um, engagement. And another one that's related is um, Scottish Water have learned a lot of lessons. Is there a network of organisations where that su successful carbon reduction practices can be shared so that, um, so that other companies can use that sort of similar template? Is there a network of um, uh, other companies that are trying to achieve net zero? Elise, that one to you. Um, so yeah, there are a number of informal uh, networks and obviously we are, um, uh, we're a, we're owned by the, the Scottish government. So um, we obviously work uh, closely again uh, within the network of uh, Scottish government organizations, as well as SEPA. So yet yeah, we're not doing this uh, alone because we can't actually achieve any of this alone. Um, and we are you know, needing uh, to work with others to, to achieve that. Um, an area where we need to get better networking is with the agricultural sector. Um, but, um, you know, uh, that we certainly are 
you know, there are networks uh, around there, uh, but there needs to be more, more of that. And then we need to back that up with funding that will really uh, support partnerships of people and restoration, for example, uh, and really join up the funding with these organisations as these networks so that we can make more of a difference. Thanks, Elise. Um, uh, Camilla and then Pete, anything on the what can we do with STEM engagement uh, to well, um, improve awareness? Camilla. I was just going to highlight uh, one of my slides which threw up um, a slide about the just transition process because I think um, we're, we're going to be in the same position in 10 or 20 years time until we understand and address the politics and distributional consequences of the energy transition that we need to make. The just transition process, which has been launched by the Scottish Government, is trying to make sure that as we make that energy transition, we don't leave particular groups behind. And it's those groups left behind that can very often create not surprisingly, the sort of political resistance to these changes. So flagging up the work of the Just Transition Commission is, is really key um, in helping other places also uh, try and address this critical problem, which is behind, uh, you know, the rise of people like Donald Trump. Peter, the last word to you, make it good. Well, I, I'm not sure it would be, it would be good, but one thing I... I think that the Royal Society of Edinburgh could perhaps do is um, a better and more interaction actually with popular social media platforms. I suspect in part due to the sort of demographic of a lot of the Royal Society of Edinburgh members that we're perhaps not as engaged with that kind of material um, as, we, as we should be. And increasingly that is where people are getting their information about a whole range of different things. And, and a friend who, who works in the media um, a, you know, a couple of months ago, was asking about you know, whether I've got Twitter accounts or the extent to which my colleagues look, working on glasses and climate really publicise um, our work through social media. And I know it's something that we're very poor at. Um, I suspect it's something that the Royal Society of Edinburgh could, um, could pot potentially do better because there's a, a lot of expertise, but perhaps not as much um, social media um, publicity as there could be. And perhaps a, an absolute key thing um, would be to ensure that the members of the RSE who really are involved in sort of policy at high level policy or have expertise and influence can, can sort of use that um, more. And I suspect that's a, re a relatively small number of the members. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Peter. Right, so I think we, we need to bring it to a close so we're coming up to the end of our hour now. So I'd like to thank the panelists and also the audience and the, the excellent questions that, that you've submitted. Sorry, we didn't get time to deal with them all, but I think we've dealt with a small cross section of them. Um, I'd like to remind you about upcoming events in the Curious um, series. So there's one more panel event next Wednesday. So have a look and see what that's all about and see if you wanna get involved in that. And there are also tea and talk group discussions on a daily basis on various topics as, such as sustainability, genetics, saving the oceans, applied gaming, and all those sorts of things. So lastly, we welcome feedback on how the RSE's online events have gone and how they can be improved. So please do let us know if you have any ideas of how we can improve them. So thanks very much to everyone again. And um, I'd like to say thank you and wish you all a great afternoon. Okay, thanks. Bye.